the good old days. Let me take you back, back to the good old days. Let me take you back, back to the good old days. Let me take you back. Salo falava, malo le sue fuo, moe male langia mamma. Mi san polevinaka, che mi saka na bekanda mai viti. Hello everyone, and welcome to Talanoa Tupe. The 2020 general election will now be held on the 17th of October, along with the end of life choice and cannabis referendums. This episode is our election special, so we're going to do things a bit differently today. We're sitting down with Basavika candidates from Labour, National and the Green Party to find out about their respective journeys and their motivations for putting themselves forward. We also have a set of political questions that we will ask each of the candidates to answer for you to compare and make an informed decision. Let's hear from our candidates. Talofa Barbara, welcome to the show. Talofa Lover, thank you very much for having me today. Oh, it's my pleasure. Barbara, you were um, born and bred on Auckland's North Shore to Samoan parents. Can you tell us about your background and um, your experience as a first generation Samoan living in New Zealand? Yes, yeah, so I, I, I think my story is a very typical Pacific story, which is uh, my parents came from Samoa in 1978. Uh, my father is from Faliula in Faliagu, and my um, mother is from Safuku and Fasiko Uka. So um, they came to New Zealand to the land of milk and honey, um, you know, for a better education for their children. Um, they landed in um, Auckland's Ponsonby in a rat infested sort of home. And then as the Pacific Tide moved to South Auckland, um, my father decided to capitalise their family scheme benefit and um, their savings, and they bought a house on Auckland's North Shore mm. in um, suburban Glenfield. So um, my parents, um, just the same thing as many Pacific parents, wanting better outcomes for their children, education, you know, and that's why they came to New Zealand. Um, unfortunately for um, my family, my mother passed away a couple of years after they had bought their first home. Mm -hmm. She died from cancer. So um, she died when I was four, but uh, we buried her on my fifth birthday. So um, it was a hard time for my father, but um, my father was the eldest of 11 and the only one that went past four form at school. So he actually got a tertiary education. So he went on the DPB to look after my mother when um, she fell sick. And then when mum passed away, he stayed on the domestic purposes benefit. And then when I went to college, he um, went back to social work school to become a social worker, where he became one and he worked as one until um, 2017. Mm. But um, despite all that, um, my father sent us to the, some of the best schools in Auckland. So um, the Catholic school that we went to, Carmel College, which is on the shores of Lake Pupuki. It's quite a beautiful school. Mm. Um, my sisters and I and my brother went to the brother school, Rosmini, which is down the road. And um, we had a really good education. But the, um, the interesting thing was just across the hedge was North Shore Hospital. And at North Shore Hospital, um, my aunties and my uncles were like the cleaners, the orderlies, and were the cooks and the, the kitchen hands. So it was quite the juxtaposition of having um, a decile tens Catholic school where your mm. children were going to, getting the best education in New Zealand. And then right next door, your family's working in the bowels of the kitchen. Mm. But um, yeah, growing up in Auckland's North Shore, it was very different compared yeah. to my cousins, who a lot of them were brought up in South Auckland. Um, the school we went to, there was only a handful of Pacific children, a handful of Māori children. So, um, but the same sort of Catholic values, those um, Christian values, were quite deep in the school that we went to. So it was important for us and important for my father that we finish our education. Mm. That's such an amazing story of overcoming adversity. Then you went on to study at university and you studied law. And um, by the time you graduated with your law degree, you had five children and now you have eight. Yeah, um, <laughs> <laughs> bit of a surprise, unexpected. <laughs> But um, it was, 
Yeah, I went to law school. Um, you know, I, I, I'll admit it, I was quite a lazy student um, before I had my children. I was quite um, cruisy, you know, I would just go to university just to pass. And then in my second year of law school, I got pregnant with my eldest daughter, Acacia, who's now 16. And for me, that just totally switched my mindset. It became that I couldn't fail. She was, um, you know, when you have mouths to feed, really drives you. So mm. for me, that gave me purpose to actually knuckle down. And so by the time, yeah, I'd finished my law and arts degrees at Auckland University five and a half years after falling pregnant, yeah, we were um, had four pregnant with number five. And um, yeah, for my husband and I, it was quite a difficult time. My husband uh, worked as a manual labourer, as a timber machinist. So he was just earning above the minimum wage and I was studying full time. Mm. So it was really difficult to um, make ends meet as you do as a young family. But um, we both knew that me continuing in my education was an investment in our family's yeah. future. Mm. So fortunately for us, um, having the children and for a lot of Pacific young woman, um, I think at the time they, uh, we were faced with a bit of adversity from family saying that, well, you know, what a waste, her life is over. But actually, it just, for me, just drove home, gave me purpose and gave me meaning as to why I had to study really hard. And we were really fortunate at the time that um, my parents-in-law, the Edmonds family, they were extremely supportive of me studying and of supporting our young family. So um, every day, Chris's mother would come across the paddock because we live right next door. She'd come across the paddock. She would um, look after the kids from like seven o'clock in the morning. I would go to university at like eight o'clock in the morning, stay there for lectures till about four, come home, cook dinner, clean the house. My husband would come home. By the time we'd settled the family to bed around about 10, 10.30, then I was ready to study. Mm. So it was hard and it was mm. self-inflicted, but it was, <laughs> it was definitely worth it. And um, I remember my husband to help me not feel so lonely while I was studying, and because I was still breastfeeding children at the time. Um, he would come and camp out in the lounge with the kids, so they would all sleep on mattresses while I was on the dining room table studying. Mm. And it was just, um, you know, typing away, doing assignments, baby would cry, feed them, go back to your studies. So, yeah. but again, it's finding what your what drives you when it comes to studying and, and using that to push you through, particularly through the hard times. That's a really powerful motivation, having mouths to feed. Yeah, it is. Yeah, and so great that you had the support of family and you had um, you know, a village around you to help you get through that time. Yeah, and it, it really goes back to that saying, you know, it takes a village to raise a child, and that's how as Pacific people... Or eight yeah, children. For eight children. <laughs> <laughs> as Pacific children, uh, people and as Māori people, that's just how we were, you know. Mm -hmm. And so um, there's no way that we could have got through that stage without the support of our families. Because mm. Chris is Māori. Yeah, he's yeah. Māori, yeah. Mm. So Chris is Māori from Ngāpuhi. Mm. Um, his family is... Um, from Karatu and from Kaikohi. Mm. Yeah. So um, going to law school and working very hard to raise your family and study and pass all of your exams, you then went into tax law. So what was the attraction to tax? Um, so I was really, um, wasn't a huge attraction if I would be absolutely honest. Um, it's one of those things in life that sometimes when you're given an opportunity, you just take it. So for me, I had the choice of going to a private law firm as a summer clerk, so it was a temporary role, or to take on a full-time role with the IRD National Office here in Wellington. And um, for me, it just came down to what would feed our kids, uh, what would make it permanent, um, you know, just a steady stream of income coming through. And so we decided to move down to Wellington and take up tax because it was a permanent role. Fortunately for us, the global financial crisis hit that mm. year, that particular year we moved down. And a lot of my friends had finished law school at the same time as me actually really struggled to find mm. jobs because the, you know, normally clerkships that firms would take 14, they would now only take two. Mm. So um, we really dodged a bullet mm. and um, sometimes these opportunities come and if you don't take them, you don't know what's gonna happen. So we just, we bit the bullet, we moved away from our family, from our safety net, and we moved down to Porirua. And we've been there for the last 12 years, just mm. um, with our own little family, just bringing them up, trying to bring up good human beings. So that was 2008 that you moved down to yeah. Wellington? 2009, 2009, yeah. So 2008, I finished law school, and then uh, it was kind of a reconnaissance mission to move down to Wellington. Because mm. you can imagine with um, being pregnant with five, 
it was quite a difficult move, a big decision as well to move away from those safety nets, but um, yeah. it was well worth it. Yeah. Mm. And so um, how did you find the experience of moving to Porirua? Oh, Porirua was, is a beautiful place to bring up a family. Um, when we came down in the Labour weekend before we moved down, we came through Porirua and it was sunny and there was a regatta on the harbour and there was waka ama happening. And then we moved through Johnsonville and towards sort of the south of Wellington and it started raining. So for us it was a clear sign to bring up our family in Porirua. Mm. And um, it's been home, our, our children all go to the local schools there and so um, we've been actively involved in our community both through school boards, um, we set up sports clubs, uh, we help run the local rugby club with the tag, with netball. We've just, um, the thing is when you've got eight children you get actively involved. Yeah. So um, it's just, it is our life and that's the community that we come from and that's where we're bringing up our children because it's a good community. Mm. And you've been quite supportive of the um, music program for kids in Puriru as well. Yeah, so um, Virtuoso String Orchestra, um, when I was 14, um, my father, we had to stop. I was learning the violin for a year because I got a scholarship through the school. And then I had to stop because um, my father couldn't afford the fees. You know, he's a sole income earner with four children. So um, what had happened was um, I had to give up violin and it's always been on my bucket list to mm -hmm. kind of learn. So two years ago, um, to help with stress levels when I was working, to help with my mental health, I bought a violin and started to um, reteach myself through YouTube. But for, so for the last couple of years, I've followed the Virtuoso String Orchestra, which is a program run out of Cannons Creek um, with some amazing families, again, just trying to get opportunities for children to learn music. So um, they've become closer friends in the last couple of months. And um, for me, just what they stand for, which is to allow for opportunities, I really back that, especially in our mm. community in Porirua. And they're making quite beautiful music and making that available to our Pacific children. Mm. That's awesome. So it's time for us to take a short break, but when we come back, I want to ask you about working in the Beehive. So you have been working in the Beehive now for four years? Four years, yeah. Yes, and you've served under three different ministers, including Judith Collins. Yeah. Um, so what have you learned from uh, serving different ministers across the political spectrum? So working as the, I uh, worked under two national ministers and now one Labour minister. When I worked under two national ministers, I was what we call private secretaries. So I was the IRD person that was put into their office to look after the revenue portfolio. And then when Labour came in, um, I switched to a political role to look after five different portfolios. What you learn very quickly is that ministers work extremely hard. They um, are very committed very dedicated and ultimately even though it's the National Party and it's the Labour Party they're trying to make the best decisions that stick to the values of their party so um, it's been an eye-opener that's mm -hmm. for sure um, it's definitely a privilege to work in the Beehive um, and for me serving under two different governments I mean it's quite clear where my political bias sits you know having now running as a Labour candidate but um, for me it is just a real recognition and acknowledgement that these politicians uh, are there because they want to make a difference. Mm. And for ministers, those that are fortunate to be a, a cabinet minister, they're there to make the, the hard decisions. And um, as my particular role is to support them in making those decisions. Mm. As you know, I've worked in the Beehive as well, and I have observed just how incredibly hard ministers um, of any stripe work. Yep. And uh, it is a very difficult job. Um, so I really admire people who put themselves into the political arena. How have you found uh, the transition from going to um, neutral public servant, um, then to um, senior ministerial advisor where you're in a political role, and now you're actually running um, for as a candidate yourself? Yeah, it's been a real adjustment. Um, um, I'm quite used to being behind a camera, <laughs> not in front of a camera. Um, and in, in particular, I mean, the reason why I'm standing for Labour is when um, the national government, when it switched over to Labour, it was like someone had stuck a, a vacuum pipe at the top of the beehive and they just sucked out all the national party and then they put in the Labour people. And I felt an instant um, 
connection with the Labour team because they were Pākehā, they were Māori, they were Pacific, they were Asian, they were from all different parts of the community. So for me it felt like I was coming home. But um, to go back to your question, it's just um, to come now from from being um, in my community, serving my community, just because you do it voluntary, because it's the right thing to do. And that was what was taught for me from my own father. And then coming into the beehive and then taking on a political role, it just seems like a logical next step. Mm. Um, but yeah, it has been an adjustment. Um, I've been really fortunate that I have a supportive husband. Mm. I needed to hear it from his mouth saying, yep, I'll support you in this, in order to actually put my hand up fully. But um, the Labour team have been extremely supportive. Um, having worked with a number of them, both the members of parliament and ministers, I feel well supported in that. And so um, now it's just being able to enjoy the journey because I know um, a lot of people say campaigning is extremely hard. And um, if you can imagine campaigning plus eight children, <laughs> it's going to be quite a bit of a balance. Yeah. But um, yeah, you just got to have some fun along the way. Mm. And so um, for me, it's just an adjustment, but um, I'm having fun so far. Barbara, so with eight kids, you must have a whole heap of activities that you need to do. Yeah, it's um, pretty crazy um, on any given Weekend we have up to 10 games to get our children to. Um, this year we only have six, fortunately, because some of the games have moved to the weekdays. Only six, only six games <laughs> on a Saturday. So um, generally it would start with rugby, um, three games of rugby, and then we'd have three games of netball. Um, but for me, um, it's just our children enjoy it and it keeps them busy, it keeps them fit, keeps them healthy. So we've always kind of been active within the sports clubs. But it's also um, for our kids, we get, um, we're quite active in their schools as well. So um, sometimes they join quite nicely with the sports in the school. So we've been able to, to lead some campaigns from um, Porirua Kids, so Titahi Bay Intermediate. We took um, 22 kids to the Ames Festival, um, the Ames tournament, which was in Tauranga a couple of years ago. So, you know, we raised $22,000 so that the children mm. wouldn't have to pay so much to go there. Um, but it's the same with um, Mana College. So I'm on the school board there. My husband used to be on the school board of Titahi Bay um, Intermediate, and I was on the board of Titahi Bay School. But for us, it was just, there are children in our community that don't have an option but to go to the local mm. school. Mm. Um, a lot of um, there are pockets of our community that drive past our local schools yeah. and send them to schools outside, which is you know their choice. And um, but for me and my husband, we want to make sure that these local schools that the kids don't have a choice but to go to are the best schools. Mm -hmm. So um, we've been quite active in those um, schools for a number of years, and that just comes down to whether we're managing a team or coaching or you know or on the school board helping the principals make considered decisions. Mm -hmm. So for you. It's campaigning, um, eight children, plus also working your full-time job as well, right, on top <laughs> yeah. of all of that. Um, so how are you um, finding that balance? And like, is it an adjustment for your kids now because they will be seeing mum's face on hoardings all over the place? Like, how have you prepared them for what's to come? Yeah, so for the kids, um, when I decided to put my hand up for selection for labour, um, we did sit down the older three and said to them that this is what mum's thinking about doing. And it was like, oh yeah, that's okay, as teenage kids do. And then actually when I did get selected as the Labour person, and, and we actually sat down the whole family, and um, because my youngest is seven and my eldest is 16, the messaging has to be a little slightly different, you know, in a kind of plain language so they understand. And it was, you know, mum's face is going to be on a billboard, and it was for them to, to understand that there is Barbara Edmonds, the politician, the Labour candidate who's running for mana, and then there is Barbara Edmonds who's their mum. So being able to explain to them that you might hear things, that, um, you, that people saying bad things about mum, or you might see mum's hoardings which are defaced, but you know what they're doing, it's not personal, it's not to mum, your mum, you know, it's to Barbara Edmonds, the politician. So, I mean, they've kind of understood it. Um, my daughter, who's 16, and, and it's quite a you know special time, and she's got her first ball coming up. Um, for her, I think I've really seen quite a maturity in being able to understand that because there's been a couple of things that she's had to, um, I've asked her questions about. And she said, well, I don't care. And I said to her, well, that's good you don't care. She goes, no, sorry, 
I do care, but actually it's not my problem. If they've got a problem with something you've done, they should go talk to you. Mm. So, you know, for a 16-year-old to be able to reflect that, you know, it gives me quite a lot of pride that, um, yeah, that she's she's got her head screwed on and she understands the difference, yeah. Mm, that's a really mature insight. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I yeah. wish I was that mature at 16. <laughs> Um, that's something I actually wanted to, to ask you about because um, in your um, personal story, your father sacrificed so much to send you to a Catholic yeah. school. Mm. Um, and like, was that a big decision to not send your kids to a Catholic school? Um, it was probably an easy decision. My husband's not Catholic, so that was a decision for us to not bring our kids up Catholic. Um, obviously believers, but not Catholic. Um, but for us, we live by those Christian principles and values of looking after your neighbour, of service, that, um, you know, looking after the poor as well. So even though um, you may, for some of our community, we're not as active in our churches as we used to be, particularly in our first generation, we're looking at different churches than the, than the traditional ones. Um, for us, it's just living those principles and those values and being able to serve our communities in different ways. Mm. And do you do that? in your culture as well? Yeah, I, I wish it could be a bit stronger. So um, one of the, probably, dis, I'd say perhaps a disadvantage is that having gone to a really good school in, in Auckland's North Shore where there were very small pockets of Pacific people is that I did lose my language, so my mother tongue is Samoan, but now I can't speak it confidently or fluently. I can understand it, but I don't speak it as fluently as I would like to. So for me and my husband, we're not strong in both the Samoan culture or the Māori culture unless we're with our families. Mm. So it's been quite a learning experience. And then what we've kind of come to the position of now in our older age and, you know, after being away from our families for so long, is that actually we want to go back to that. We want to go back to solidifying that for our own family because when we go back to Auckland to see our family, the children just love it, you know. Um, the good thing is they haven't lost their love of Samoan food or island food. <laughs> <laughs> they still love that, so okay. we, I think that's just inherent. <laughs> but um, it's something that we need to go back to and rediscover. Mm, and I think that that's um, a journey that a lot of Pacific people in New Zealand can relate yeah. to. Particularly first-born New Zealand. I mean, you know, a lot of our aspirations are different from that of our parents. Mm. You know, it's still the same struggle of keeping food on the table and paying the rent. But for a lot of my generation, it's we've now become professionals or we want to run businesses or we want to be the manager or we mm. want to take the tertiary education or become the, the tradesmen who now own their are sole traders. So um, different aspirations, but still rooted in those very core Pacific values of service, of looking after other people and of care. So, mm. yeah. And so for you, what is the ultimate goal um, in running and like putting yourself forward? Yeah, so for me, for Mana, so Mana is um, quite a diverse electorate. It goes from Linden towards Tawa to Judgeford um, towards the hut. It goes all the way up to the Kapiti Coast and then out to Mana Island in the west. Um, for over 10 years, my husband and I have worked in that community, um, in parts of our community. And for me, it's just being able to reflect that community and to take that voice into Parliament. Um, I've, having worked in Wellington and especially in the Beehive for the last four years, you learn quite quickly that if you're not connected to your community, those voices don't come through and you lose touch. So for me, it's um, just being a good representative of mana and having lived there, we're invested in mana, our children go to the local schools, being able to know what the local issues are and being able to have those connections within the community. Um, I think for me puts us in a good steed, which means I can take a good voice about what are the real issues for Mana into Parliament. Mm. Well, Barbara, thank you so much for coming to share your story with us. No, thank you for your time and thank yeah. you for the opportunity. Yeah. yeah, we wish you the best for your campaign. Thank you very much. What is your party's plan for Pacific Peoples? So the Labour Party plan for Pacific People is thriving, resilient, prosperous peop uh, Pacific people. Um, we are really fortunate in the Labour Party to have five ministers. So that means that we have three voices at the cabinet table and we have two just outside of cabinet. So being able to have those voices at the table means we're able to push for initiatives and for programs that benefit Pacific people. And what it's turned out to be is some of the largest investment of any government in Pacific peoples and policies. 
What is your party's uh, plan for the economic recovery and how do Pacific people fit into that? So part of the um, budget 2020 was some of, again, some of the biggest investment in Pacific peoples. So for example, the Tupu Aotearoa program, which is helping bridge from fifth people who are, sorry, learners who are just over 15 and bridge them into employment. It's helping them with CVs, with driver's licenses, with um, interview prep. So it's being able to get them work ready to meet the new environment, particularly for those who are not in education, employment or training. Um, so it's being able to put investment into those programs that help Pacific people directly. Um, another particular policy that was announced in Budget 2020 was a, a big investment into our Pacific festivals. So those are key for our Pacific communities. You know, you think of Polyfest, you think of Pacifica. That's where we can reconnect and identify with our Pacific homes. So that for the government understanding that um, during the COVID and the economic recovery that those funding sources have dried up, being able to have those, um, the ability for those organisers to be able to tap into that government um, funding is extremely important. Mm -hmm. What would you like people to consider in the upcoming referendum on cannabis? I think it's both probably consider for both cannabis and the euthanasia referendum, which is to do your research. Um, as there are, as we saw unfortunately during COVID, there was a lot of social media and rumours that sort of misinformation. What's really important for our Pacific people is to actually research and have a look at what the different bills that we're actually voting on, what they're actually saying. And if you, you know, not all of us are lawyers and can read law, but there are some government websites which are neutral that don't provide an either for or against. Have a look at those because it'll tell you what the actual referendums are, what you're voting on. But if I can ask our Pacific people, my plea to you is this is the only time, an election is the only time we are equal, both as Māori, as Pacific people, as Pākehā people. We all only get one vote. In this particular time we get the two votes, but also for the referenda. So do your research, think hard about it, and in the end, your vote counts. So please vote. Um, what is the achievement you're proudest of to date? For me, as a Labour candidate, um, being involved in the Labour government, I would have to say, um, and as a mother of eight, it's the families package. That huge investment through working for families through the winter energy payment meant that the cost of living was brought down for a number of our people. Um, in particular, the families package, it was a huge boost in income for a lot of our families. Um, for me personally, as uh, an advisor having worked in the Beehive, um, for me politically, it's being able to work on the gun reforms post the mosque attacks uh, March 15th. So, you know, to be in the thick of it when the Prime Minister decided to ban those particular guns, I was given the privilege to be able to work extremely closely with police to help review those laws, to help push through that um, piece of legislation. What we did in 27 days is what would normally happen over 18 months. So, you know, there was a lot of sleepless nights during that period, but for me, I'm extremely proud of that leadership and that decision making by the Prime Minister that gave us the mandate to make those changes. Because those changes weren't new, they were actually um, recommended back in 1997. Mm. But um, yeah, for me, that's my personal, um, what I'm most proud of. And how do you want to be remembered? Oh, it's always quite a philosophical question. <laughs> I want, I want to be remembered as a good person who did their best by their community, who um, was a good mum and um, just a decent human being. I think that's pretty much sums it up. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Let me take you back. Let me take you back.